Hello and welcome to Views from the Market, Mid-Market Private Equity and m in Canada. My name is Mario Negro, and I'm a partner in the Private Equity at m and Group at Steichman Elliott. For today's podcast, I'd like to welcome our special guest, Erica McGinnis. Erica is a partner at Sequera Partners. Erica, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Mario. Thanks for having me. And thank you for this podcast. I really enjoy being out on the West Coast, being able to tap in and feel connected to the East Coast and to the Canadian market through this podcast. You have a great story at a great firm and want to tell that story to our audience because it's one people should know. So maybe we'll start a little bit by talking a bit about you and your history and then Sequoia and the work you do at Sequoia. Sure, that sounds great. So I am a partner and Sequoia Partners based in the Vancouver office. Sequoia Partners is a mid-market M&A advisory firm in Western Canada with a focus on sell-side advisory and valuations. I've been with Sequoia Partners for over 10 years. And what drew me to that firm was really the vision of the founding partner of the firm, Arun Sequera. So he founded the firm in Edmonton and really built it up with this vision of providing that best-in-class service to the mid-market clients here in Western Canada. So Arun founded and built an advisory firm in Calgary that was acquired by one of the big four firms. And as he came in and ran that m and practice in Western Canada for that big four firm, ended up having that entrepreneurial itch to get back to doing things in a boutique way. And so from that, founded Sequoia Partners in 2010. At the time, the firm was focused primarily on m and in the energy service sector. But from there, we've grown significantly to a team of 25 professionals working in Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver. And you play a unique role, not only from the fact that you're in Vancouver, but the type of deals that you do. And maybe we talk a little bit about that because I know, Erica, you spent a lot of time on insurance m and and it's one of those areas that I think people don't appreciate how much activity there is in insurance m and in our marketplace, particularly in the mid-market. So I'd love to hear more about your work in insurance m and the work you do, what you're seeing out there, and the nature of the transactions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I mentioned that our firm was focused on energy service to begin with. From an industry perspective, we currently service a diverse range of industries. With energy service being that background, we've expanded into a number of different diverse industries that really reflect the Western Canadian and Canadian marketplace. So if I think about the deals we're working on currently, we have technology, industrial, manufacturing, transportation, logistics, hospitality, food and beverage, and of course, as you mentioned, insurance brokerage. So I think from the perspective as a firm, we're quite diversified. You need to be in Western Canada and be able to work across a number of industries. And I think we have developed a strong ability to get up speed on our clients' businesses, regardless of the sectors. So insurance brokers specifically, we've advised a total of 14 transactions since 2018, ranging from 15 million enterprise value upwards to 200 million in enterprise value. We are in line to have two more closes, one in Q3 and Q4 this year, and really have built that up as a strong area of expertise within the firm. And that's probably where I spend 50 to 60% of my time. It's focused solely on that industry. Our initial start in that industry is quite a common story. Our first client was an individual that we had a longstanding relationship with just in the business community, generally in Vancouver, and got to know. And eventually they were exploring their succession plan, considering options, and looked for advice from Sequoia Partners to help them through that process. From there, we'd grown the practice area from that initial client, which focused in group benefits to a number of different insurance brokerages, ranging all the way from West Coast to East Coast across the country, and in that group benefits, wealth management, and PNC brokerage focus area. Erica, you know, I don't know if our listeners may appreciate how much activity there is in the insurance brokerage M&A space and the, the nature of the buyer. I know a little bit for myself, but private equity is very active in the space. Their strategics are active. Maybe just a quick kind of snapshot of the landscape, which makes the space so attractive, not only for a broker who wants to sell, but just in terms of the nature of the buyers. And this is a very lucrative space in all fronts, it seems, from what I know. But you might tell me I'm wrong, but from what I know. Yeah, absolutely. It has been an area where we've seen a lot of activity. You know, when you step back and think about what are the drivers of that activity, you can look at it from the buy side and then also look at it from the seller side perspective. So thinking about it from the buy side, if you look at the players that are most active, they're private equity backed strategics. So in Canada, those players include Hub, Navicord, 
NFP, Westland, People Corp, Sinex, Sterling, and the list continues to grow. Why? I think the business fundamentals of insurance brokerage line up really well with private equity investment strategies. Low customer concentration, high recurring revenue, embedded organic growth. It's a fragmented industry. There's been a lot of consolidation, but there's still a lot of opportunity out there because it remains highly fragmented. There's low recurring capex, sticky customer relationships, and it's type of business that is recession resilient. It does good in good times and pretty good in bad times as well. So this has continued to attract private equity investment in the sector, and I think will continue to do so. And the interesting thing, there's been a number of private equity firms who have had success in the sector nationally and internationally. It's almost created this ecosystem of folks that can then go out and cross-pollinate as they move around to different private equity firms, share that experience, share that expertise, and have that insurance program being a sector that more firms continue to look at. I mean, you highlight the nature of the space in terms of the sellers and the activity. Have the multiples of this space increased? Have the nature of the space increased with the increased activity? Yeah, absolutely. We've seen upward pressure on valuations. And I think if you asked us two years ago, are valuations going to continue to increase? It would have been tough to say definitively yes. But here we are and we're continuing to see that upward momentum on value. We talked about that buy side driver of activity, an important thing to consider as well is just really from the sell side, like why that activity and what are the items and factors that is helping create that volume. One of the elements that we're seeing is, you know, in general succession planning as a mid-market professional, you've heard this as well, you know, this succession wave that's coming across for business owners, it's affecting multiple industries. But in this industry, I think the valuation metrics and that upward pressure that you referenced, it creates a challenge, right? Because there's business owners that are looking to exit, potentially looking to sell to that next generation of leaders. It's challenging as multiples have continued to reach all-time highs across the industry. So there was one example of a P&C brokerage we worked with in 2021. And at the time of the transaction, there were 20 shareholders, but One shareholder who had a larger proportion of equity was looking at their succession plan. So an older shareholder wanting to retire. And when they look to that next generation to purchase in and buy him out, that appetite to do so at market value just wasn't there. And they may not have had the capacity to be able to buy him out at that valuation. So that was the impetus to start a broader process, right? in terms of looking at the why and why we ended up getting engaged to help them find that next fit. I think, too, we've seen on the seller side, three other main reasons that folks have been looking at transacting with the industry evolution and having that ability to have a voice on a broader stage. One of the transactions we worked on early on was around the time that G19 was being proposed in 2018. And G19 was effectively looking at taking regulation to the way that benefits brokers, life insurance brokers disclose their commission. And there was this element that being part of a larger organization would enable you to have a stronger voice and enable you to participate in a better way in that dynamic. And that was the impetus for that deal in the why and how that got some momentum behind it. And then I think overarching, there's this element of tech investment, insurance companies generally, they're big, giant companies that are slow moving and have been around for a very long time. You're seeing this need for tech investment to continually improve the client experience and also make things more efficient. So as people look at the, how am I going to continue to service my growing client base when it's so much harder to find good talent in our industry, like that's a challenge that this industry is facing among with many other industries across Canada. But finding those people, like, can you look to technology to invest in and create that efficiencies? And so that piece has well been a driver to why it may be worth exploring partnering with one of the larger consolidators in the space as well. Erica, you know, we've been seeing insurance M&A activity that's been strong for years. And it's interesting because I would have thought that the consolidation has taken place already. And yet every year you still see more activity, even with all this activity, how consolidated is this space? Are we at the top of the curve with the sense that there's not many left? Or is it one where even though we've seen it for many, many years, there's still a lot more to come? 
Great question. I think feeling that sense as well, there has been a lot of consolidation. You get to that point where there's not many viable independent brokerages left, but there still are some. So what we have seen from a valuation standpoint is, you know, that premium valuation that you may have only paid for a brokerage that was of a certain size, like north of 100 people, et cetera. You're now seeing that type of valuation still trickle down into brokerages that are a step down in the size because of that consolidation that has happened. And there's not that many independent brokerages left out there. But I think we're still seeing activity. We're working with a couple, kicking a couple processes off right now. And there still are sellers out there. The challenge at this space, too, is those sellers that haven't sold at this point, it's not like they haven't been approached, right? The consolidators at this space are very active. They have robust corporate development teams. They're actively out there connecting with both. So usually there has to be that why, you know, as you think back to the factors that we talked about on like what drives that sell side activity, there has to be something that changes in there from their perspective to want to explore a deal. And I think for some where they haven't yet, it just hasn't been the right timing for them. But that doesn't mean that it won't ever be. It's just a matter of the right timing hasn't come along. Okay. Well, we have you want to take advantage of obviously Sequoia and your expertise on the West Coast and particularly when it comes to the middle market. One of those people who sees the West Coast as an underserviced, great middle market environment where there's just gems of companies that a lot of people just don't go after, which they should. I mean, I want to get a sense of you. Is the market still strong? Is activity still strong on the West Coast? Are you seeing anything unique about deal activity on the West Coast from your experience? Yeah, you know, absolutely. We're still seeing a strong amount of activity on the West Coast. I think as a firm right now, we have 16 active mandates across a variety of industries that I referenced previously. The challenge is, I think if the activity is still there, processes are taking longer. You know, I'd say that's something that we've noticed, just folks digging in a bit stronger in due diligence, processes taking like a month or two longer and extending out, but the activity is still there, right? And so, the challenges that we've faced on some processes, is there a seller-buyer valuation disconnect? Still closely in the rearview mirror, what is that years of 2021 and 2022 even, where we were seeing those record level of value and activity in the sector? And so thinking through how do we creatively bridge that, that's been coming up a bit more in transaction processes. And then also just digging in and taking the right time to get things done. But overall, from an activity standpoint, we're still seeing a lot of appetite and a lot of folks still need to go through their succession planning, considering transactions. Any particular industries you're seeing as being, I want to say the word hot because that sounds too strong, but active or particularly active or any type of buyers you're seeing on the West Coast particularly active in this environment? Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a lot about insurance brokerage, and we still see that as a very active base that we're working in across Western Canada. Engineering, environmental consulting, like we're seeing that space be another sector that we're spending a lot of time in. Those industries are very different, but they tend to be people-driven businesses that you can drive some or conclude some similarities from. And then beyond that, you know, I think our bread and butter industrial businesses, there still is a lot of activity out there. And if you take where the firm is at today, and it sounds good news for all of us, including me, that you, know, you guys are busy. When you're busy, I'm busy. So that's the awesome news. Where do you see the market going? I mean, it sounds like it's still strong in terms of at least activity. I always ask our guests the crystal ball question, where they see the rest of 23 and where they see 24 from where you're sitting in the work you do. Where do you see activity going in terms of getting deals done and the opportunities in front of you? Yeah, I think there are a lot of moving parts and I do not have a crystal ball. You know, we do see a strong amount of activity in the market. You know, as I mentioned, things are taking a bit longer, but the fundamental drivers of mid-market M&A are still there. And so I think we expected to see the rising interest rates dampen valuation. We have seen that in some industries. We've been talking about insurance brokerage today. We've yet to see it in that industry specifically. You know, I think from that perspective, we're still seeing upward pressure on valuations and we're still moving those processes forward. That prompted me on one story on a recent deal that we've gone through, which I think is an interesting indication of the insurance brokerage markets specifically. We went through a fairly broad process and approached a number of different parties to find that right fit. And in our initial bids, we saw a gap of 117% between the lowest bid and the highest bid. And that's particularly surprising because all of these players are active market participants. They're all 
folks that you'd classify as those typical consolidators. And you would think from a sell sign advisor perspective, they would be very aware of current pricing trends and what's going on in the space. But the takeaway for me from that was it indicated that disconnect probably driven by on the low end, that party is maybe increasing their discipline in their M&A strategy, being a bit more calculated in their fundamentals and their approach to value. And then on the high end, you were seeing that party really lean into, okay, this fits in our strategic priorities and we're willing to come to the table with something very compelling, despite some of those macro factors that are out there and being at play. So, you know, if we had that same process two years ago, that gap, which we've had, that gap is in that 20 to 25 percent range. And so takeaway from that process to me was really there are some market factors at play. It's not necessarily a given that valuations are going to be here. There are parties that may be leaning out in certain processes. But that being said, there's still going to be very successful outcomes for business sellers and owners in these instances. Erica, I wanted to say thank you for joining us. It's been great to have you on multiple levels talking about, you know, your experience with insurance brokerage m and and activity in the space, but then also talking about Sequoia and activity in Western Canada. It's a great perspective and I uh, really appreciate you joining us. Appreciate the opportunity to be here.